Well, good afternoon. Uh, now we're coming to the grand finale of this meeting, perhaps, uh, eventually with the Fisher Memorial Lecture, and I'm chairing this uh, session, and it's my pleasure to introduce Daniel Couch, who was formerly my fellow, who's going to talk to you about some of the work that he's been doing uh, with a group of us on the genetics of the human face. Dan. Can everyone hear me okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Sure, I'm speaking to you. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to talk. Uh, as Walter says, I'm just going to be giving an overview of our work on genetic association mapping of facial phenotypes in humans. I'm often asked why this is an interesting thing to study, and I uh, hope to convince any doubts among you otherwise using this slide. Um, so the face is a really good opportunity to do some interesting genetics. Um, first of all, it's extremely highly heritable, probably one of the most heritable traits around. Uh, and secondly, uh, facial features tend to run strongly in families. By that, what I mean is um, individuals will tend to bear close correspondence with particular relatives, like a, a mother or a father or an uncle or, or a grandmother. Um, and this suggests the presence of uh, large effects uh, genes, um, in contrast with the kind of things that come out of geno genome-wide association studies, which uh, typically have very small effects and don't really lead to concrete biological insights in the way that large effects can. Um, to kind of um, conceptualize this, it's uh, you can picture a, a highly polygenic trait like height, where there are thousands or hundreds of genes involved. Um, individuals tend to be roughly a blend between their grandparents uh, with respect to a feature like that. So they'll, they'll inherit close to 25% of their alleles from each of their grandparents and consequently be roughly the, the mean of them. Uh, whereas with um, uh, something involving a small number of genes or a single gene, you can only really get that gene from one or possibly two of, two of your, uh, your, your close uh, relatives. And so you'll take entirely after one of them. And uh, it's this, this kind of um, inheritance model that I think can explain the pattern of inheritance we see in, in facial features. There are also useful applications, most obviously in forensics, uh, also in surgery, so if presented with um, a patient who has a con congenital syndrome, uh, surgeons are very keen on using what they call objective outcome criteria, and they use those to kind of direct their surgery, give them something to aim for. At the moment, this is usually achieved by using uh, just the average feature within the appropriate ethnic group, uh, but it would really be better to be able to predict what a patient would have looked like if they didn't have a, you know, the, the uh, deletion or the insertion or, or the point mutation that's, that's giving them their syndrome. Uh, finally, uh, face is also quite an evolutionarily interesting phenotype. Uh, it's probably involved in recognition of kin, recognition of uh, reciprocation partners, recognition of group membership in kind of group selection type models, and also in uh, signaling of genetic fitness, uh, mate attraction, uh, and similar processes. So the data set we're using here is the people of the British Isles. It's funded by the Wellcome Trust about 15 years ago and consists of about 4,000 DNA samples. It's unique in that um, the majority of individuals have at least three grandparents that come from within the same geographic region. So it's very well controlled for population structure. And uh, more recently, we obtained uh, 3D photographs on about 2,000 of them, in addition to other normal phenotypes, uh, things like hair color, skin color. Uh, in addition, we have 3D <coughs> photographs on 1,500 twins. So this is uh, 350 to 400 um, MZ twins and a similar number of DZ twins. And I'll talk about how we use those in a bit. The camera we use is like this. Uh, it takes a photo from, from each side. There's a pointer on there. Yeah. Uh, takes photos from each of these cameras um, and multiple photos from each side, which allow it to sort of triangulate the position of the surface of the face. And it produces uh, something like this. This is the data you get out. You may recognize this gentleman. Um, and uh, what this is basically showing is. Uh, uh, between 100,000 and 150,000 points in 3D space, each with a 3D coordinate, uh, in a kind of wireframe orientation. And then over the top of that model is a 2D photograph that's overlaid, which captures pigmentation and sort of texture, things like that, 
and I'm not using any of the 2D information uh, in, in the present analysis, it's just the, just the 3D structure. Uh, to make sense of that data requires a bit of work because at the moment that photo is just sort of floating in the frame somewhere and it's difficult to make comparisons between individuals uh, using that raw data. So we have to go through this quite complex registration process, the first stage of which is to annotate at uh, 14 landmark positions. You do that manually, although you can do it now with the aid of a computer, speeds things up. Um, and what this is doing is assigning a sort of biological meaningful uh, position at each of these places. Then what the algorithm is going to do is overlay uh, everybody's face at each of these 14 landmarks so that they match at those positions. And then it uses the surface information to basically assign uh, 30,000 points now, um, down from 100,000 or so. Uh, so a slightly less complete but still very complete description of the face. But each of these 30,000 points now has a, an identity so point one might, for example, refer to uh, the tip of the nose or a particular position on the cheek or something like that. But we know it means that in every single individual. And so now we can make comparisons between individuals at each of those variables like, like any, kind of, any other kind of multivariate analysis. Uh, so you recall me saying at the start that um, facial features are highly heritable. Uh, we know this because MZ twins look basically the same as one another. You can't tell the difference between them. Um, and what that sort of entails is that in order to do effective genetics on the face, you probably need to be getting really heritable measurements, otherwise you're doing something wrong. So with that in mind, we try and extract as much heritability out of, these, out of this data set as we can. And to do that, we developed this breeding value prediction method. Um, essentially, the assumption is that each, each variable k, this is in a single individual, it's a random variable, can be written as the sum of uh, the breeding value, which is y, that's just the expected phenotype condition on the genotypes, and then uh, an error term, which captures the effects of the environment, and uh, more likely a large amount of measurement error. Um, and the task we set ourselves was to uh, find a set of weights here that predict the breeding value for individual i at uh, variable j from all other variables on the same individual. So you're kind of averaging over um, points surrounding the point of interest and, and all other points on the face in order to sort of smooth out the, uh, the error and the environmental variance. Um, and then you do that for each j in turn. And uh, this set of weights can be used on, on every individual. And uh, after a, a fair bit of work, you can show that the, uh, prove that the, the least squared estimates for those thetas look like this. Um, so the thetas are down here. These are your weights. Uh, lambda is uh, a Lagrangian parameter. Um, and uh, the matrix in the middle here is just a variance covariance matrix. You just get that as standard like you would from uh, any kind of data set. And on the right-hand side, you've got the uh, additive genetic covariance between variable j, which is a variable of interest, and each other variable. And you can estimate this from the twin data. Uh, that works fairly well. So um, in uh, blue here is the histogram of the original heritabilities, uh, which is in blue. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, sort of centered on uh, kind of... Uh, 75% or so, and then the uh, breeding values, which we call additive genetic values here, um, these are just transformed versions of the same variables, and they're shifted up in heritability. Um, this is measured on an independent test set. And uh, perhaps more importantly, the variance is reduced as well, so we lose a lot of these really uh, you know, moderate to low heritabilities. Those have shifted up quite a lot. And the important thing about this is that we haven't used any genetic, um, well, no molecular genetic data in doing this. We haven't looked at SNPs at all. It's just all based on relationship data. And the reason for that is that we're going to use the twins' data as a, as a replication set. So, you know, we had to avoid the use of, of molecular data, otherwise we'd be biasing our repli replication results. So what we do with those phenotypes is um, essentially take all 30,000 of them um, and you actually have 90,000 variables in total because each one has a 3D coordinate. And you subject that to uh, principal component analysis and then inspect the principal components for their heritabilities and also whether they show large differences between ethnic groups. 
use that to pick a, a subset of interesting PCs, and then dichotomize them into uh, you know, a top 10% of extreme individuals, and then a, a bottom 10%, and then a load of people in the middle. And we test the extremes against everybody else. That's the kind of um, uh, experimental design, if you will. Um, and uh, I'm just going to show results for one of, those, one of those PC phenotypes. So this is PC2. And we're testing the bottom 10% of individuals against everybody else. And what we're interested in is uh, a combination of the effect size and the significance. So um, we use a very kind of liberal um, criterion for, uh, for statistical significance here. We just take 1 times 10 to the minus 4. Um, but also require that the SNPs have a large effect size. So here, um, this, this corresponds to an odds ratio of about 9, uh, actually close to 10. Um, and there's only one SNP in, in this particular test that satisfies those conditions. And across all our phenotypes, we see about 27 SNPs like that that we take forward for replication analysis. Um, and uh, this is done in the Twins UK data, which is a bit smaller. And you see uh, something of a, a small inflation going on here, but we probably lack power in this data set to really, uh, to really replicate effectively once you take into account that these effects are going to regress to the mean somewhat when you test them in an independent sample. Uh, but there's a slight suggestion of something here, but then three of them do replicate with a, a false discovery rate of 5%. And interestingly, um, all of these are under a recessive model. So I'll just show uh, one of them. This is the same one from the, from the volcano plot I showed. Um, this association here is really being driven by these six recessive individuals. And the odds ratio under a recessive model is, is nearly 10. And you get the same thing in the twins. So the twins replicate under the recessive model rather than you know, an arbitrary uh, genotypic model. And the odds ratio is regressed to the mean, but it's still quite high. And the overall estimate combining the two is about seven and a half. This is much higher than anything you see in genome-wide uh, association studies generally, um, but it's, uh, it's driven by a smaller number of individuals in the extreme and possessing a, a, a minor homozygote genotype. The phenotype in question looks like this. So what these are are average faces taken um, within sort of phenotypic bins. So the, the bottom 10% of individuals, when, when you average their face, it looks like this. Um, and uh, this is the one that's associated with the minor homozygote. Uh, these are the individuals at the other extreme. Um, and these ones cluster statistically with uh, Asian individuals. So you recall me saying that one of the ways we inspect these PCs to, to find the ones that look most interesting is based on ethnic differences. And this is one of, one of those phenotypes. Um, so these are, these are European individuals that have a sort of Asian aspect to their face. And it appears to be in the chin area. So the chin is a bit more recessed in these individuals. Whereas the ones at the, the other statistical extreme, the kind of the most non-Asian looking people, if you will, uh, have a kind of more, uh, more pointy chin. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about any of the other phenotypes. Um, but I'll just show one last slide, which is uh, really to uh, hammer home that you wouldn't really necessarily pick this up as a particularly interesting effect if you treated it as a quantitative phenotype. So this is the principal component binned into 5% uh, bins. And uh, the uh, genotype frequencies of the minor homozygote and the heterozygote are plotted in each bin. And you can see there's, there's not very much going on for most of the distribution. It's only in the tail that you see a strong preponderance of the minor homozygotes and a, a, a really strong paucity of the heterozygotes. But if you, did a, if you did a linear regression of that, you might find something s significant, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't stand out as a particularly strong effect, really. Um, so I'll just leave it there. This work was published in uh, January in PNAS. Um, and uh, I just thank uh, all the study participants and my co-authors. Yeah, got one over there. 
I'm sure you must have thought of this already, but have you thought about the possibility that some of the, the variation might be maintained by frequency dependent selection at some of the loci? Yes, um, I think that's, that's very likely. We haven't done any modeling on that. Um, I think it's, it's, it's an obvious explanation for why there's so much facial variation generally and also, also explaining uh, particular variants like this. That, I mean, the, the allele frequency, I should point out, is about 10%. So it's, it's pretty, you know, it's high enough to be uh, maintained by some process like that. So, so you mentioned that, you know, that something we all appreciate, that it's very hard to tell identical twins apart. There's a lot of facial variation, but that's our subjective um, judgment, and we have evolved in order to recognize faces. Yeah. Would those patterns show up in some objective way just from the statistics of morphometrics? Um, what you mean, the, the extreme similarity of... Yes, does it look similar in the statistics? Um, well... Yeah, so if you, if you compare the MZ twins, the, the just, if you just calculate the raw heritabilities mm. from, from this data set, it's, it's, it's pretty high. They're, they're not astonishingly high. Mm. Um, they're kind of, uh, they max out at about 80%, which is partly why we developed this breeding value prediction method. Mm. But I, I think that's largely probably measurement error in the technology. Right. So you do, you do see variation between individuals when you take multiple pictures. Mm. And uh, you know, it's probably changes in expression, things like that. But um, what about variability being higher? Does that show up in some way? Um, the variability between... You're uh, saying there's more facial variability than for other skeletal proportions or something oh, like that? Oh, um, we haven't done a sort of systematic analysis of that, no. Uh, that, that would be interesting. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of similar, I guess, to heritability of height or something based on the measurements we're dealing with. The variability of the face, if it's all genetic, hmm. right? Uh, and since it's so huge that there's no two people in this room who look identical, uh, you couldn't classify people by any qualitative character otherwise that I know to that extent. Yeah, I just wonder if we're very good at doing that. And, uh, it, I wonder if we're just very good at doing that, that it's more a cognitive feature rather than a morphological feature. Yeah. I, I don't really understand the nature of, that, of, the, of, of the comment, Nick. I, I would say that what, what we recognize, there's a huge amount of specialization in the brain for recognizing facial features. And what we recognize must be the components that are inherited. Because you can still recognize me at my age, even if you saw me 30 or 40 years ago. So I think that's the key to the... To my mind, the key to the uh, uh, analysis of the phenotype. Well, we should move on, and the next speaker is Gerald Hadfield from Edinburgh, and he's going to talk about Hamilton's rule, Hamilton's rule in multiple dimensions. You'll explain which Hamilton, no doubt. Uh, does this work? Yeah, okay, I have a tendency to walk around. Oh, I need to talk as well. So, uh, every time I give a theory talk, I promise I will never do it again. Um, but since this is in honor of Fisher, I've, I've been tempted back. So I'm going to talk about um, social evolution, an 